uh, I don't really consider it Islamophobia. Islamophobia means to fear Islam. So these people who run this industry are not really afraid of Islam. Now, certainly there are people that are afraid of Muslims, and that's unfortunate. These are people that we should reach out to and people that we should educate. But this industry known as the, uh, the Islamophobia industry is really an industry that is fueled by anti-Muslim uh, bigotry. Uh, so if anti-Muslim bigots with financial incentives define our terminology, and this is very, very important that we define our own terminology, terms like jihad and sharia, ah, and even like taskia or tasawwuf, which they're uh, um, defining as this kind of antinomian, sharia rejecting uh, tradition within our religion. If we let these people with financial incentives define our terminology, then they will control the discourse. And whoever controls the discourse will tell our narrative. And whoever tells our narrative will educate the masses or miseducate the masses. There are Muslims in America that become atheists all the time. And these are people whose ancestors were awliya, they were ulama, they were mashayikh. And in one generation, Islam is gone. They've apostated, they've become atheists, they've left the religion altogether. So one point of miseducation I want to begin with is this idea, this theory that Muslims are violent people. So there's a good book by a political science uh, professor at UC Berkeley named M. Stephen Fish, F-I-S-H, like the fish that swims. He has a book called Are Muslims Distinctive? Uh, a look at the evidence using reliable data set, sound scientific methods, in objectable, uh, objective frameworks of analysis, as one Princeton professor put it. So Professor Fish found that most Muslims in America, sorry, most Muslims in Muslim-majority countries are not inclined to favor the fusion of religious and political authority or even remotely prone to mass political violence. He finds that while gender inequality is severe, and a lot of that is culturally based, Murder rates and class-based inequities are far less severe among Muslims than non-Muslims. So I want you to look at this. So according to the FBI, according to the FBI, according to the Department of Justice, and I realize people in this masjid are probably not taking notes, but you can watch this khutbah later and write down these numbers. From 1980 to 2005, 94% of terrorist acts committed in America were carried out by non-Muslim elements from 1980 to 2005. According to the Department of Justice, according to the FBI, 94% of terrorist acts carried out in the U.S. were done by non-Muslims. More acts of terror were done by Jewish elements. More acts of terror were done by white supremacists, Christian elements, Jewish Defense League, the Order, the Aryan Nation, the Ku Klux Klan, the Army of God, the Hutaris, we never even heard of these, these people. The question I get a lot, because I talk to a lot of non-Muslim audiences, is why don't you Muslim scholars denounce ISIS more? The question I get all the time. So one of my colleagues had an interesting uh, way to deal with this, and I tried this, I was speaking with a group of about 400 people, 90% of which were probably non-Muslim, so I said to them, have you ever Googled Muslim scholars denounce ISIS? Have you ever Googled it? And nobody raised their hand. Why haven't you Googled it? You expect it to come to you? Have you heard of the open letter to Baghdadi? Have you heard of this? No one raised their hand. 120 signatories. And these are just not, you know, Joe Schmo, Joe Abdul or something. These are ulama that have sway over the hearts and minds of tens of millions of people signing this document. 700 ulama in Tulab al in India alone signed a document denouncing ISIS. 700,000 in India alone. So don't expect MSM, mainstream media, to give you the truth. You have to search for it. The reality is information is selected for us. We're not getting the whole picture. We're not even getting half the picture. Uh, every year, Google has to uh, submit something called the Annual Transparency Report. This is when the government orders Google to take things off of YouTube and search engine results. The number one reason why is hate speech. Hate speech, right? And of course, hate speech in a country that espouses freedom of speech is totally subjective. What's interesting is Voltaire said, if you want to know who controls you, determine whom you're not allowed to criticize. <laughs> so hate speech is the number one reason. The second reason 
is uh, copyright infringements. The third reason is criticism of the government. This is the third reason why the government orders Google to remove things from YouTube results and from search engine results. I'll give you a simple example. We all know the first African-American professional baseball player, Jackie Robinson, number 42. His number is retired in every team in the league. No one can wear number 42. Who was the first African-American NFL player? Who knows? Was he any less of a pioneer? Did he uh, suffer any less racism? Why don't we know about him? Because he just wasn't that good, right? But he's not less of a pioneer. So I talked to a lot of non-Muslims, as I said. And a non-Muslim woman one time stood up, and I, I hate to name drop, but I think it's important, and sometimes I'm a professor, so we have to have uh, honest dialogue. A woman stood up and she said, tell me about Joe Harzanayev. I said, who? And she said, Joe Harzanayev. I said, who is that? She said, don't you know? Of course I do. One of the alleged Boston bombers. And I asked her, she's an old lady, old Caucasian lady in her 70s or something. I said, how did you memorize that name? It's a difficult name to memorize. She said, I don't know, I just hear it all the time. Exactly. You hear it all the time. I said to you, have you heard of Eric Rudolph, Brian Stone Jr., Wade Michael Page? Anders Brevik, have you heard of these names? Never heard of them. Why not? Check this out. Wrap your minds around this one. Since 1970, there have been 140,000 terror attacks worldwide, according to the Department of Justice. 140,000. If all of these were committed by Muslims, which is nowhere near the reality, this hypothetical, if all of them were committed by Muslims. That's 0.00009% of the Muslim Ummah. And people want to say Islam is violent? Muslims advocate violence? This is a terrible, terrible, non sequitur argument. You'll be laughed out of any logic class. If your conclusion is therefore Islam is inherently violent or Muslims are violent, when 0.00009% percent of the Muslim Ummah has committed terror attacks. That's if Muslims have done all of the terror attacks, which is nowhere near the reality. In 1925, 60,000 hooded Klansmen marched on Washington, D.C. Did you know that? In 1925, 60,000 hooded Klansmen. According to PBS, the national membership of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was between 3 and 8 million According to Pew Research, the number of Muslims in America right now is about 3.3 million. That means there was a time in America in the 1920s, there was potentially double the number of Klansmen than there are Muslims in America right now. Double the number. Possibly triple the number. Yet I would never characterize, well, oh, Christianity is a violent, you know, racist religion. There's a billion and a half Christians. It's a terrible argument. Why do people make these arguments? It's mind-boggling to me. Sometimes we have to take people by the hand and lead them a little bit. People don't know the difference between Muslim and Islam, believe it or not. People try to convince me that my religion is violent. I ask them, what's the difference between Muslim and Islam? I don't, I don't, is Islam the country? Are, are you Islam? This is what I get. Are you Islam? Oh, well, that's a pretty deep question. It's a deep existential question. Am I Islam? SubhanAllah. So we have to make things simple for people. Islam is the active participle. Islam is a Muslim is to Islam as Christian is to Christianity. Let's start there. You have a senator, Santorum, who gives us two-hour speech on the dangers of Sharia law. It's a dangerous thing, Sharia law. Two hours. A Muslim 20 years old asked him after his speech. Excuse me, Senator. What are the five maqas of the Sharia? What are the five aims of the Sharia? Sharia 101. Uh, um, what? That's like me giving this uh, impassioned, uh, um, critical analysis of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. When breaking down the Latin, it's always oh, wrong here, and he's really, he's, well, he's misquoting this over here. And then a Christian asks me, what are the four Gospels? And I say, John Paul, Ringo, George, right? No. People don't know the difference. ISIS is to Islam as the KKK is to Christianity. 
Use that one. That's a good one. Terrorism is to jihad. This is from Abdul Hakim Mullah. Terrorism is to jihad as adultery is to marriage. To the untrained eye, to the uninitiated, they look the same, but they're very, very different. Did you know you're more likely to be struck by lightning than to be shot by a Muslim terrorist in America? Did you know you're more likely to slip in the bathtub and kill yourself than be, to, to be shot by a Muslim in America? Did you know you're more likely to get shot and killed by a toddler, ever so often a toddler, a little child, finds his parent's gun and shoots and kills someone? You're more likely to be shot by a toddler than by a Muslim terrorist in America. And in Europe, over the past five years, 2% of terrorist acts in Europe are done by Muslims. People haven't heard of Anders Breivik, the so-called neo-crusader who killed 77 people in the name of Christ. Obviously, that isn't Christianity. But it's so easy in our minds to differentiate the two. But we've been indoctrinated. We've been brainwashed into thinking that terrorism and Islam are one and the same thing. Another point of miseducation is that Muslims worship a different god. Right? You hear this from the likes of Walid Shabbat, who describes himself as a former Muslim terrorist. Right? These con men who perpetuate this idea. Allah was the Babylonian moon god. And then he has this ridiculous theory that I've already debunked. Look at my talk online. Is, is God Allah? Totally debunked of the sign of the beast, the mark of the beast, the book of Revelation. You sit there and laugh for 10 minutes. But then you look at the number of hits, 500,000 hits, 600,000 hits, 1 million hits. People listening to this guy, because he speaks Arabic, he must know what he's talking about. Every Tom Dick and Abdul, who's Arab, speaks Arabic. Oh, obviously he knows what he's talking about. Another logical fallacy, an appeal to unqualified authority. People don't study logic. In early Christianity, there was a movement called Marcionism, where some Christians said the Jews worship a different God. We worship the real God. Now the paradigm has shifted. You know the, uh, the Aleph Lam in the word Allah? There's an opinion, it's a definite article. Al Ilah became Allah. That's not the dominant opinion, according to Edward Lane in his beautiful lexicon. He says the Aleph Lam in the word Allah is cognate to the Aleph Lamet in the Hebrew. Elah, Elohim, Elo. These are cognates. That's how you say God in Hebrew. That's what, that's what it says in the Bible. In the Arabic translation of the Bible, done by Christians, Genesis 1 1, Kitab Taqweem. In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. Isa alayhi salam, he spoke Syriac. This is a uh, Semitic language. According to a Christian text, a Christian text called the Peshitta, Jesus says in Mark 1.15, Shram le zimne wa matyaf malkutha da Allah. The hour has come. The kingdom of God, malkutha da Allah, is at hand. This is how Isa alayhi salam said God. Not only did Isa alayhi salam call God Allah, there is no theological difference between the teachings of Isa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. In the awla nas bi Isa ibn Maryam fi dunya wal akhirah wa laysa bayni wa baynahu nabiyun aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. The nearest person, <coughs> the nearest person to Isa alayhi salam is me, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is saying. In the dunya and in the akhirah. <coughs> and there's no prophet between us. Isa alayhi salam according to Christian sources he described Allah as Echad. This is probably the only time you're going to hear some Hebrew in the Muslim. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. This is what he says according to Christian sources. God is Echad. God is Ahad. Allahu Ahad. If you ask a Christian at random, I'm not picking on Christians. Right? I'm not trying to disrespect the religion. But ask a Christian at random. How do I get to heaven? If they're a Trinitarian Orthodox, which are the women, Majority, I say, oh, Jesus is God and he died for your sins. Not he sacrificed himself to make an example. No, he died, he took on your sin, his vicarious atonement. Isa alayhi salam, according to Christian source, Matthew chapter 9, is, is quoting the Old Testament, is quoting the Hebrew Bible, because Allah tells us, that Isa alayhi salam said, I confirm the theology of the Torah. In Matthew 9, he says, I require mercy, and not sacrifice. 
فَدَعَتْ إِلَوْهِمْ وَمَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ And the knowledge of God may or not over burnt offerings. It's about rahmah, chesed, mahabba, rahmah. And da'at ilohim, ma'rifatu Allah, knowledge of God, not burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is what he says according to Christian texts. Another point of miseducation, that there's no love in Islam. You hear this a lot. You have these so-called former Muslims going on satellite television from, you know, Muslim countries. I can pick on the Persians, the Iranians, I'm Persian. We prefer Persian over Iranian, by the way. It sounds more friendly. <laughs> and, you know, this guy goes on TV, and I challenge him to a debate. And I said, what's your beef? And he said, he says, Ali John, Dar Islam, mahabbat vujud nadar. Islam, khushunatas. I said, really? He said, there's no love in Islam. Islam is just violence. And I asked this guy, this former Muslim, what are, the six, what are the six articles of faith? Wallahi, he couldn't name them. He didn't know what they were. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he is the founder of Quranic exegesis. مُفَسِّرُ Quran, مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مِنْ أَسْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ He said, لِيَعْرِفُونَ Sorry, لِيَعْبُدُونَ means لِيَعْرِفُونَ I did not create jinn and humankind except to worship me really means except to know me to have ma'rifah And then he says, and if you knew Allah, you would love Allah So the entire affair is about love The whole point of creation is love there's no love in Islam. You have these challenges on social media. Show me one verse of the Quran that says God is loving. And people can't do it. What are you talking about? Where are we? Wahul Ghafur al Wadud. Wahul Ghafur al Wadud. He is all forgiving. He is loving. The Prophet is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the Prophet of love. This is his station in the Hadith and Tirmidhi. And the Sahaba were sitting and discussing the various maqamat of the Prophets. And they said, no, Adam alayhi salam is chosen by God. And Nuh alayhi salam, he's chosen by God. And uh, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam is Khalilullah. Musa alayhi salam is, is Kalimullah, the confidant of Allah. And Isa alayhi salam is Ruh Allah. Wa kalimatuhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he emerged and he said, I've heard your conversation. And what you're saying is true. Ala wa ana habibullah. Wa la fakhr. Indeed, I am the beloved of God. And I do not boast. This is who he is. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we say Bismillah rahman rahim what does it mean? Do we know? We just say it. Something my father says all the time. I don't know. In the name of God, the, in, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving. When the woman lost her son and the Sahaba spread out to look for her son and they found her son and gave her gave him back to her, he crawled away, and she started to hug and kiss and breastfeed her child. The Prophet said, can you imagine this woman taking her son and throwing him in a fire? La wallahi, by God, no. Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. He said, did you know? Did you know? Allah is more compassionate and merciful. Allah is more compassionate towards his servants than this woman is to her son right now. There's no love in this tradition. When the Bedouin came into the masjid, the Prophet was on the minbar, and he was giving the khutbah, and the Bedouin came in, and he said, Mata sa'a, mata sa'a. And the Prophet motioned, sit down, don't talk during the khutbah, sit down. And then after the khutbah, the Prophet said his salams, and he said, man is sa'il, who is the one who was questioning me earlier? He said, ana, ya Rasulullah. What was your question? Mata sa'a, what is the hour? Wa mada adatta laha, what did you prepare for it? The Sahaba said, we were so annoyed at this Bedouin, interrupting the khutbah. Annoyed. And then the Prophet said, What did you prepare for the hour? And he said, La shay'a. Nothing much, nothing with respect to a lot of prayers and fasting. I just do the minimum. I just do the minimum. But I love Allah and His Messenger. Now the Sahaba are listening very intently. A person will be with the one whom he loves. And as Ibn Malik said, we were so annoyed at the Bedouin, but we had never been happier that he had come and asked this question.
<laughs> we had never been happier than we when we heard those words from the Prophet ﷺ. How do we increase our love for the Prophet ﷺ? Benedictions upon him. How do we increase our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Dhikrullah. I'll give you a case study in love. The transformative power of the love of Allah and the love of Rasul. Sayyidina Umar wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ. This is the most evil intention in the history of humanity. When he was struck, Sayyidina Umar was martyred standing in the mihrab of the Prophet ﷺ. In the masjid, his feet were touching where the place of the Prophet's feet used to touch. He was stabbed under his belly button six times. I'm sorry to say by a Persian, Abu Lubdu'a. And Sayyidina Umar, he falls down, he grabs Abdurrahman ibn Awf from the front row and pulls him up, says, lead the prayer. Some of the Sahaba broke ranks, they threw a shawl over this man. And Abu Lubdu'a takes his own life under the shawl. And Sayyidina Umar says, was he Muslim? They say, no. He said, Alhamdulillah. And they give him some milk and it comes out of his stomach. They can see the milk flowing down his clothes. They know he's going to die. He knows he's going to die. And he said, what do you want us to do? Ya Amir al muminin He says, go to my mother Aisha. This is what he's thinking about. This is what he's thinking about. Go to my mother Aisha. And ask her, not, you know, my son, my daughter, my family. No, no, no. Go to my mother Aisha and ask her, can I have that spot? The greatest real estate in the universe next to my Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can I have that spot? So Abdullah ibn Umar goes to Aisha and says, my father, he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar is asking for your spot in the Rauda. And she says, yes. And she goes back to Umar and he says, Alhamdulillah, laysa shayin fi nafsi aham min dalik. There's nothing more important to me in this world than that. And then Sayyidina Umar tells his son, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says to him, uh, when I pass away, go back and ask her again. Maybe she said yes out of deference for me. And don't say Amir al Mu'minin, say my father Umar. My father Umar. So Sayyidina Umar passes away, and Abdullah ibn Umar, he goes back to Mother Aisha and says, My father Umar is asking for that space. She says, I already said yes. I already said yes. This is a testimony of love. Another point of, another important point. We have our young people going to colleges and universities without a broad grounding of Islamic tradition. You know, if you do a PhD program, you have to submit something called Statement of Broad Grounding, which is basically bragging about yourself for four or five pages about why you're qualified to even write a PhD. We have to have broad grounding. This is important. We need to have our own academic institutions. And we have to have the courage to send our children there. Many of our children come out of the university system more unintelligent than when they went in. More unintelligent. They lose their common sense. They went in believing in a benevolent creator who loves and sustains his creation. And they came out believing that we're on some planet, on some backwater solar system, on some random galaxy that's spinning out of control in some endless universe that's going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Nothing special about us. There's a trillion universes. There's probably a trillion Earths in the world. What's special about you? Oh, so... It's not true then, because the scientist told me there's nothing special about us. I know about the universe now. It created itself by causing itself to explode for no apparent reason. It's philosophical materialism. Systematically removes the divine. This postmodern, nihilistic, critical theory that people study now in the university. Right? That there's no objective morality, everything subjective, there's no objective truth. They quote these philosophers, and Derrida and Foucault is total garbage. This is where your 50K is going, intuition. They go into the university knowing that there's two genders. This is common sense, XX and XY. They come out of the university, uh, I think gender is a social construct. There's no biological gender. There's only uh, biological sex. And it depends on your feelings, right? They have terms for the gender fluidity, gender non-binary. I can wake up tomorrow and decide, I feel like a woman. Therefore, I'm a woman. So I expect you to call me a woman. That's called mental illness. If you're a man, you're not a woman because you feel like a woman. There are people who say, I feel like a rhinoceros. I'm not joking. Look at the logical conclusion of this. It's called transspeciesism. I'm not joking. Transspeciesism. There are people who say, I'm a rhinoceros. 
Don't call me he and his. Call me Ri and Riz. These are my pronouns. This is totally serious. This is what's happening. Their parents are asking their children, 10-year-old children, what gender do you want to be? And the boy says, a girl. Then they mutilate the child. Suicide rate in the transgender community is a steady 40% because people keep reinforcing mental illness and delusion. You don't give them help. Somebody comes up to you and says, I'm a rhinoceros. You shake them. What are you talking about? You're a human being. You're doing them a disservice. A man can never be a woman. A woman can never be a man. We're physically different. We think differently. Men and women think differently. This is politically incorrect science, apparently. Our rods and cones interact with light differently. That's how different we are. Doesn't mean that we're unequal, but we're different. Somebody can transition into a woman who's a man. Every cell in his body has a Y chromosome. They go into these universities knowing that homosexuality is a sin and unnatural and harmful. I met this master's degree student and Muslim in psychology who said to me, I'm having issues with my iman. My iman is damaged. I said, why? She said, because gay people are so nice. That's the reason why? This is your, this is your argument? So we should sanction his lust? What about a heterosexual male who wants to sleep around with a thousand women? Let him do it. Forget about the commandments of Allah. You know what? He's a nice guy. This is your argument? Interesting. Do we ignore Allah to sanction our lusts? Or do we strive against our lusts to uphold the last commandments? Who takes priority? They go into the university knowing that the human being is Khalifa to Allah. The human being is the viceroy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they come out believing after this random big bang, right, that inanimate objects, inanimate matter, like uh, wood and gas, form living cells. That happens all the time, right? from living cells, and that eventually there was this goo in the ocean, and this goo became a fish. And then this fish eventually crawled out onto the beach. Don't you hate it when you're sitting on the beach and the shark comes out and spontaneously turns its fins into lungs? Don't you hate when that happens? What are you talking about? What? And then this became a small woodland creature, and then it became a monkey, and then a bigger monkey, and then it became a human being. This is what people are taught, right? It became us. If that's true, there should be millions, trillions of mutations and transitional form skeletons in the earth. Where are they? Darwin said we'd dig up the earth and find them. We didn't find anything. We've barely found a dinosaur. Where are they? We should have trillions of transitional form skeletons. They have like two or three, you know, built down man, which is a hoax, and Lucy, probably ex extinct apes or ape bones mixed with human bones. There are two things. Here, here they are. Here's the... Here's the missing link. There should be trillions of them. Say 98% of our DNA is the same as a chimpanzee. Didn't you know that? Did you know, a nine, did you know that a watermelon and a jellyfish are 98% the same? Let's eat some jellyfish. There's 2% that's different. And that's not even true, by the way. But we're entertaining what they're saying. There's 2% difference. But in this 2%, there's something called the akal. Right? I like to say a group of chimpanzees do some engineering and build a skyscraper. Do some... Spherical trigonometry. This is our differentia. God created Adam in his form. What is the form of Allah? It's majaz. It doesn't mean Allah is a surah. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in mutlaq, absolute knowledge that is perfect, we also have knowledge that is contingent, derived from him, but limited. We have the ability to reason. This is why the khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the human being. But they want to tell us we're just animals. This is why people start come, stop coming to the masjid. This is why the youth don't come to the mosque. They're harboring these things. They don't tell you. They tell me. I'm in academia. We have people over there criticizing circumcision. Oh, this is brutal. Child abuse, circumcision. Yet advocate abortion. The killing of children. Most of them are girls, by the way. There, are, there used to be laws in countries where you can only have one child. So you have a girl abort, a girl abort, a girl abort. When the little girl buried alive is going to ask, why was she killed? You have people who criticize the killing of animals. They protest. There was a gorilla shot at the Cincinnati Zoo. Right? And there was protest. Harambe. His name was Harambe, by the way. 
Harambe, long live Harambe. He, people protest walking in the streets of Cincinnati. Protest, oh, animal rights, cruelty. There was a human child he had in his hand. He was shaking around, he killed a child any time. What are you talking about? During that week, bombs were dropped on Syrians. Who cares, right? No protests, civilians, men, women, and children. Not priority, we're just animals. There are people who go into the university believing that ultimate justice is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom al-Qiyamah. And they come out these radicalized neo-Marxists who want to establish their utopia by any means necessary, even to the detriment of their own values and beliefs. Even if it means slandering and insulting Ahlullah, ulama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you disagree with them. Man adani waliyan faqat adhamtahu bil harb. Whoever shows enmity towards my friend, my wali, take notice of war from me. People who attack the ulama because of a difference of opinion, you put yourself in danger of su al khatima, of a bad ending. This is mujarrab, this is tested and tried over time. People who attack the Prophet sallallahu the mustahzi'un, the those who abuse the Prophet and make fun of him, not a single one of them became Muslim. Read your sirah. Not a single one of them. It's very dangerous. But this is what's being taught to these, a lot of these kids, our children, and we're paying for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to build our own institutions. And they give us the courage not to fear loss of wealth, not to fear, not to love the dunya so much that we don't have the courage to send our children to these institutions. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitabi al-aziz, ba'da nabudu wa'udu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, inna allaha wa malaikatuhu saluna ala nabi, ya ayuhal ladhina amanu wa sallu alihi wa sallimu taslima, Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala li muhammadin kama salli ta'ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim fi al-alameen, inna ka hamil al-majid. Allahumma barik ala muhammadin wa ala ala muhammadin kama barata ala ibrahim, ولا آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وانقنا شر ما قضيت ربنا لا تزقه بنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك لا إن كنا من الظالمين ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين يا مقلب القلوب والأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب والأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك وصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين